before I hand over to Eric, I would like to say a few words. Um, you all read his bio, I'm therefore not going to repeat all of that. Instead, I'd like to share how we got here today. Um, so it's a funny story because last November, I attended a virtual food, agriculture, and water conference organized by Harvard Business School. To be frank, even though I had to pay for my ticket, I missed most of it because the end of the quarter got quite busy with assignments and finals. Um, however, I was just in time to hear the closing speaker who impressed me so much that it made up for all the rest that I missed. And it was Eric Souberon, the VP of Nature and Water Cycle at Danone and Managing Director of the Danone Ecosystem Fund. Not only was the content of his presentation extremely interesting, he also delivered his speech around midnight his time in France. After the event, I immediately texted my team and said, I had just heard someone we absolutely need to get for our global exploration. Um, it wasn't easy to reach him because he was a, he's a very busy man, but fortunately for us and for all of you, it worked out. And I would like to express my deep gratitude and thank you on behalf of our team and all of our participants for speaking with us today. Please all unmute yourselves and welcome Eric Souveran with an applause. Thank you very much, Mary Christine. So I guess I shall start, right? Okay, very good. So, um, well, uh, with such an introduction, I, uh, it's very difficult to start the speech, right? So I'm very, very thrilled to be with you this, uh, this morning, I think for you uh, in the US, uh, unfortunately virtually, uh, and I'm very uh, honored to be speaking to, uh, to you uh, as an as a MBA student of Stanford. Um, honored, why? Because um, as I always say, I, I try uh, when I can to, to do this type of, of, um, of keynote speech and to have an interaction. And thank you for offering me the possibility to have this uh, one hour interaction with you. So because I, I feel uh, for good reason or not good reason, you are a very important generation. Uh, my gray hair, as you can see, unfortunately, sets me apart from your generation, but I'm still not too old. Uh, but you are a very important generation because you're the only gener you're the last generation that can change the system and especially the economic system in which we are uh, currently uh, living and operating. And by choosing an MBA, uh, one of the most uh, certainly selective MBA in the world, uh, your functions uh, out of your MBA will be very uh, determining the capacity we have collectively to adapt our model uh, in the decade of action that is opening in front of us. So to start with, I want to uh, give you a bit of my background, uh, not because I want to do a, a self-commercial, but, uh, but because uh, I think my uh, background in terms of moving as a CSO of Danone and managing director of the Danone Ecosystem Fund has been a personal journey, uh, a personal journey of 20 years that unfortunately you don't have in front of you to learn what I have learned. So uh, if at the end of this hour, there are a few things that can uh, inspire you or give you ideas of how to uh, uh, be uh, a leader in your next organization or in the next move of your career, that would be a, a good hour in, uh, invested from my side. Uh, I started my, my career as a finance uh, person. I did a lot of merger and acquisition. Nobody is perfect. Uh, when I graduated, it was, uh, it was something very trendy at that time. I think it's still for uh, many people. Uh, and then after uh, spending quite a lot of money acquiring companies, uh, I had the chance uh, to manage uh, two startups in India, one in uh, the medical sector, uh, medical device sector. And this is where I met, uh, in, a, in a very uh, simple way, uh, our current CEO of Danone, Emmanuel Faber, uh, at the French embassy, when Danone was uh, uh, divesting from one of its business in biscuits. And they were launching their dairy activity with the idea to launch not only a conventional dairy business, but also a base of pyramid business. 
Uh, and I decided to join Dynon at that time uh, directly in India. And I spent seven and a half years of my life in India trying to tweak business models to uh, reach out base of, of, of pyramid consumers. Then I moved back to Europe and I've been in charge of the mix sourcing of Danone right in the liberalization of the mix market in Europe that created a massive volatility on the prices, which was completely destroying the capacity of economic actor to, protect, to project themselves and to invest. Uh, because uh, milk prices, when I joined in 2012, was, were close to 400 euros per thousand liters. And six months later, went down to 250. So you can imagine for uh, farmers the impact of such a volatility. Uh, and we were really in a lose-lose situation because uh, we could not project our results. The farmers could not project their results. The price was fixed by the market uh, that we couldn't control. And at the same time, the consumers were progressively asking us more and more, uh, and, and rightfully so, uh, we are more and more demanding about the way we are sourcing milk, animal welfare, um, the carbon footprint of what we are producing. And it's hardly possible to, uh, to basically tackle those issues if you're fighting at the end of the month on a price that you cannot control. So we, need, we needed to fun fundamentally change the way we were operating. And this is why by using sociologists, and by going really uh, deep on understanding what was the, the way of operating of our model, I decided to propose to the Danone Board of Directors at that time a different approach that was based on the cost of production of milk with uh, a safety net uh, that we call the cost performance model. This has been a very, uh, a very big shift. Uh, and after these four and a half years, I uh, was offered by Emmanuel, who became at that time the CEO of Danone, the possibility to become uh, Vice President Nature and, and the, the Managing Director of the Danone Ecosystem Fund, which is our um, uh, social innovation fund. I'm telling you that because what I discovered uh, in uh, my, uh, my career is that many things that have been uh, taught uh, uh, in business schools, not in the West Coast in the US, but I spent a bit of time in Boston, uh, in fact, we are not right. There is no magic hand. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the price mechanism is efficient is not true. Uh, it is not. Uh, our current economic system is not taking account externalities. And therefore, we are not paying the right price on what we are eating and drinking every day if we take food. If you take a very uh, uh, interesting graph, and you can Google it if you want, you can compare the price of food with the price of oil, and you will see that there is a perfect correlation between both. Uh, correlation is not always causality, but here is statistically representative. And that means something that is very absurd, which is that we don't pay for uh, the, natural, uh, the natural capital that we're using. We pay for everything else. We pay for transport, we pay for energy, but we don't, pay for the capacity of nature to reproduce what it's giving us. Uh, and that's really at the heart of my uh, journey right now as a business person, as a, as a CSO of Danone, is to develop a regenerative business model. Because I fundamentally believe that there is a contradiction in the way we operate our economic model today. And if you are really a business person, that means that you want to create value for the future. You need to invest in nature because as I am a finance person by background, I learned that when I was investing in gray infrastructure, the infra infrastructure is depreciating over time. But the good thing with nature is that when you invest in nature, it's appreciating over time. So you have a tremendous possibility to create value that is completely undermined by the economic system today. And that's, I think, a fantastic opportunity that we need to seize. And that's an opportunity to move the food system as a problem to a solution space for the decade that is in front of us. And that's really my, uh, my very deep-rooted conviction. Uh, uh, and and, and that's, that's basically what I'm doing every day uh, as a living, 
by being the CSO of Danone, but also by running very concretely project with, uh, with uh, the Danone Ecosystem Fund. So what does that mean concretely uh, when, when I use such, such buzzwords? Um, if you take a very simple and complex issues, when uh, you are running a, a food company of Danone, everything, almost everything that you use comes from re potentially regenerative resources. <clears throat> when we grow soy for our plant-based drink, I don't know if you know silk in the US, uh, or if you uh, the, the burn silk or horizon organic in the US did our brands of Danone, or if you are in Europe, we have a Belgium a friend with us, uh, the brand Alpro, for instance, that maybe uh, you, uh, you know. Uh, basically, you have a choice. Either you grow your soy or your oat or your almond uh, uh, using the resource of the planet, or you grow it regeneratively. And if you want to grow it regeneratively, you need to think about different, for instance, crop rotation strategy. You need to think about uh, uh, different ways of, of uh, uh, approaching fertilize, fertilization. Uh, you need to, uh, di to, to differentiate your cover crops, for instance. And the good things when you do that is that not only uh, you are building the resilience of your model, but you are also using less chemical entrance. So it's less cost for your production. But also when you do that, you are storing more carbon into the soil, you're restoring soil health. So you have a positive impact on the climate challenge. And if you take the IPCC proje pro projections, we know that uh, uh, right now, uh, about one third of the pathways toward uh, the 1.5 degree scenarios of the IPCC is basically linked to the capacity we have to restore, restore soil health. The whole humanity uh, future is basically dependent on six inches of soil. Uh, uh, top soils is about six inches where it's productive. So, and this has already degraded by 30% over the last 15 years. So we have the possibility either to continue with a very linear system that is exhausting the planet uh, and exhausting soil, or we move to a regenerative system that not only can be more productive, but can also uh, solve part of the part of the climate issues, for instance. So that's what we are transitioning right now. If you take, for instance, in the US, uh, as we are speaking, we have already transitioned 50,000 acres of our production. We have committed, for instance, in the US to move 50% of our sales to non-GMO, not because we are against GMO, but because in a context, an agriculture context like the North American context, moving out of GMO means that you reintroduce diversity into your system. And by reintroducing diversity into your system, you're making it more resilient. If you take France, for instance, we committed to move all our sourcing of, uh, of um, a direct agriculture product to regenerative agriculture by 2025. We are investing 40 million euros on this. We announced at the beginning of the year a plan of decarbonization of 2 billion euros in which we have three pillars, which are agriculture, um, uh, all our packaging sourcing, and, and the third pillar on our operations. So these are just examples of how in a large organization like Danone, you can basically transform, transition your, uh, your model to a, a regenerative uh, system. And there is a last part, and this is uh, where I think my 15 minutes will end, uh, which is about how do you, do you really finance it? I think that's very important. Uh, so, uh, uh, because all that is very good, it can make very nice PowerPoint. This is, by the way, why I'm not using PowerPoint today. Uh, but what is very important is first, it needs to make good products. So I really encourage you to test our silk product, to take our two good products in the US, it's very, very good products, uh, or to take our Alpro product because they are very good. You can try also our ice creams that are fantastic, especially the, the uh, hazelnut ice cream from Silk is top. We don't have it in Europe, so I'm very, uh, very disappointed about that yet. So I, I hope we will have it soon. But this, uh, this is making good products. 
But this is also, uh, uh, and, and why I'm, I'm, I'm laughing, but this is important because if it's good product, you can price it better. That's how you create value, okay? That's when you're a FMCG company, that's the first thing, the thing you need to think of because we're business people. We're not a charity, let's be clear, okay? The second very important point uh, is of course, and this is what I said, is that by moving to a regenerative model, you make your economic model future-proofed and you're making savings at the end, right? Because by the time your soil health is restoring, your soil are also more productive. You're using, you're using less interest and you're more resilient to climate change. So at the end, that's savings for you in your business model. But there is a but. The problem is this is taking time. And this is where we have a fundamental problem right now that uh, um, the former chancellor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, maybe some of you know him, uh, uh, theorized as what he called the tragedy of horizon. And I think he's very right, is that currently there is mainly three-year money on market. And sometimes it's even more 18 months money than three-year money on the market. But the natural cycles are longer. There are cycles that are probably five to seven years. And we need to adjust basically the financing strategy around that. We need to have a different investment horizon if we want to transform the system. And there is no reason again why we should not reach that because investing into agriculture, investing into food can deliver, let's say, a low, a high single digit or a low double digit uh, return on investment. And, 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 and this is not so bad when you think that many people are lending money at negative interest rate to Germany or to France right now. So the problem is this is not recognized as a potential. So this is one of my big fights right now on a more uh, generally speaking uh, mode is to find alternative way of finance that transition because this transition cannot be only financed by increasing prices. Otherwise, you, will, you may create a problem where you will have happy few people affording to eat nice and sustainable products that will not be accessible to the majority of the, of the people. So you need to drive uh, uh, the financial uh, capacity to transform the system. And the capacity to have ROI is there, again. High, high single digit, low double digit in a market where billions of euros are invested at negative interest rates, right? So, so that's, that's, that's basically where we are right now. And we need to invent new tools. We need to invent new financial, financial uh, tools uh, to do that. And that's where it's very interesting for students like you, because you are the generation that, that have to invent this type of things, right? So, so that's, that's uh, but the room for maneuver is there. I'm very convinced about that. Uh, so that's, uh, that's in a sense, the, the message I wanted to, to pass on to you uh, without uh, being very long. So first, you have a very strong responsibility, too bad for you, but you are the last generation that can change the system. So, so, <laughs> so I, I, I'm only there to help you to do, uh, to, to make your destiny, uh, uh, but please take that as a challenge. And what I want to tell you is that this challenge can be fun because this challenge is about creativity. And I am fun, I, and I'm not against the economic system personally. Uh, I believe into liberalism. I believe in a liberalism that is uh, driven by creativity, by efficiency, by uh, best resource allocation. But we need rules of the game that, that takes into our context analytics. And this is what, what needs to change in the systems as well. And this is also why we need politics to help us to change the system. So, so when you are in a function like mine, you cannot only be very vertical in the way you work and working on your business. You also need to open up as a CSO into a broader mind and try to influence the public debate. And if you take my, uh, my sector, 
the agro-food sector right now, it's about 1 trillion of subvention every year. And my dream is that this subvention doesn't, doesn't become subvention anymore, but there are a way this 1 trillion could be invested into remunerating farmers into generating potential positive externalities. And that's again one of the, rather than trying to maintain a system that is exhausted. And I think that's also a revolution that democracy, citizens can aspire for. So they can aspire by uh, choosing the products they wanna, they wanna eat. We often say in Danone by what you eat and drink, you're shaping the world you want to live in. I think that's very true. But you can also by uh, by basically voting or deciding the political uh, choices of uh, whatever uh, systems you're in uh, is is going to drive. So good luck and very happy to open for uh, uh, questions or remarks. And I hope that was uh, in line with the brief I received. Mary Christine. It absolutely was. Thank you very much for this. It was again super interesting. Um, now, everyone, you can raise your hands um, in the participants tab and I will call on you uh, to ask your questions. And while you get ready, I'm going to start off with one question that has been in, on my mind for a while. Um, and that is, I mean, Danone is a mostly a dairy company, right? So um, I assume that a lot of your emissions come from agriculture. So you need cows and those are one of the major emitters of uh, methane and, and uh, greenhouse gases. Do you think that we can get to the sustainable future um, without moving away from the traditional dairy sector? Right, so uh, yes, you're right. Danone is a dairy company, but by the way, we are also the leader in plant-based drinks and uh, so globally. Um, and uh, we also have a very, uh, very large business in specialized nutrition for babies and also uh, a water business just to, uh, to give you. But uh, roughly, uh, I think uh, our dairy business on the 26 billion euros of sales represent probably 9 billion euros just to give you, uh, to give you uh, an idea. Um, do we have an issue with animal protein globally and are, are, is animal protein uh, consumption imbalanced in the diet globally? The answer is yes, right? Uh, and we cannot make climate objectives if we don't rebalance that. That's very clear. Um, is the, the problem more on, uh, I, I believe there is a distinction that needs to be made between red meat consumptions and dairy. There is a link, but it's not, uh, it's not a direct link. So I think rebalancing animal protein versus plant-based protein is absolutely necessary. But the first thing we have to do is to reduce the consumptions of meat, especially red meat. Uh, so so that's, that's one of the things we need to, to rebalance. Uh, is animal husbandry bad per se for uh, climate? No. And I will tell you why. Because ruminants do something that is absolutely fantastic. If they are transforming lands, grass land, that cannot be productive for any other food production into something that is edible, right? I come from uh, the Alps. In alpine areas, cows in the fields eat grass. And when they eat grass, uh, you cannot grow uh, anything else where they eat grass. Where we screw up the system is when we are transforming land that could produce something else into feed for cows, or when we are deforesting uh, as a system uh, to grow a cow feed. So this is what we need to stop, right? This is, for instance, why uh, we are launching a big program in Danone of relocalization of feed production. This is why I fundamentally believe that the right system the, uh, of agriculture for uh, dairy 
is what I call a polyculture husbandry system, where uh, at a single farm, you're able not only to grow uh, your cows, but also uh, to produce the feed of the cow uh, or in the locality. Uh, so these are the type of systems that we are promoting. And a lot of studies from Oxford University, from Idri, uh, or from Wageningen University, or even from Cornell in the US, shows that, by the way, uh, in a, a, a fully circular agriculture system, you need manure uh, in a reasonable way, and you need to utilize grassland if you want to feed 9 billion people. But the first step, Marie-Christine, is fundamentally rebalancing our diet. That's true. Uh, so, and you have countries where that means reducing consumption drastically of, I think globally it means reducing consumption of meat. Uh, you have countries where it could mean reducing a bit the consumption of dairy products, but you have countries where it means increasing the consumption of dairy products. Uh, for instance, if you take Africa or if you take uh, even part of the US, the consumption of dairy product is too low, is relatively low uh, and could be further increased. Uh, in Europe, you have countries where probably if we want to rebalance uh, to have what is called a planetary diet, uh, there should be a reconsumption. That's one thing. The second thing is that we made a very strategic choice at Danone, which is not to oppose the systems, right? This is why we, within our portfolio, propose to the consumer to have both a dairy offer and a plant-based offer, and sometimes under the same brand. Because what, what I'm, I'm, I'm think believing uh, at the end is that it's important to offer a choice and to offer the possibility of consumers to be, to be flexitarian so that they can balance their diet. You know, so I have nothing against vegan. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are vegan. Uh, I am flexitarian myself. So, uh, and I think it's very important to have a choice huh? because that's how you're recreating diversity in the food system. And that's extremely important. You have the impact of the system, this is one thing, rebalancing and reintroducing diversity into the system. Because diversity is about resiliency. Uh, we see that with, with all uh, the uh, uh, diseases, unfortunately, uh, uh, that are happening uh, uh, linked to uh, the loss of biodiversity. Does that answer your question? It absolutely does. Thank you so much. Uh, Nicole, you're Great. Um, thank you so much, Eric, for your time today. I, I just wanted to build on the question that Marie just asked around um, the emissions from cattle or dairy cows. Um, it sounds like, yes, while we do need to shift our diets from, from eating beef, for example, that might, you said, imply folks eating dairy products, more dairy products. And the, the fact of the matter is cows whether they're dairy or beef cattle, um, create methane emissions, even grass-fed cows in the way that they process the grass and they burn and have flatulence and then release methane into the atmosphere. And so I was just wondering, how does Danone think about technology or any innovation to address methane emissions with um, the continued use of uh, dairy cows, for example? Yes, thank you. So um, I think I think first of all, uh, uh, what is important is in in a system, and 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 I don't want to be too technical, but in a grassland system when it's well managed, uh, uh, basically a lot of the emissions that you have with methane are captured because uh, you you are uh, sequestrating ca carbon in the soil as well. Okay. So, so that's that's uh, that's the type of, of system that you can you can you can develop if you do it well, right? So, so, but I agree we are far from there. Huh? Let's be clear, huh? uh, Carolina. I think that was your name. Huh? So, so I think that that's where. You, so there is one thing which is changing practices first of all before I enter into technology, huh? because I think that's very important. You know, I'm uh, again I'm coming from the Alps. I'm a very concrete person. So uh, I thought uh, before going into technology, uh, I, I first 
look at what I can do. Then you go to technology. Then technology, yes, has a very important part to play. First of all, because uh, as you said, methane, I mean, you, don't say, you didn't say it, but methane is also linked to the diet of the cows. So by changing the diet and adapting the diet of the cow, especially by biotechnology, you can very much limit the emissions. So that's one, okay? I think this is extremely important. There is another very important thing that we never think about, I mean, never really think about, and that I find very interesting is that I do expect technology to be in a position to help the life expectation of cows. Huh? Because the holder of the cow, the less emission. Huh? And this is a drastic effect. Huh? So, so I am uh, running a campaign in uh, our portfolio right now to increase the life of cows. Huh? So, so, you know, I go from a very concrete and I will go to a more uh, technological angle, huh? you see, but technologies can help to solve very practical things like this, huh? right? And before we move to other alternatives, like for instance, having uh, cell-based grown milk, huh? which, which is another, another thing that we are studying. Huh? With the Danone Manifesto Venture, we are investing in startup not far from San Francisco, uh, or from the West Coast, uh, where uh, we, are, we are developing this type of technologies. So I think what is absolutely great with, with, with uh, the technologies in food is that that can help you to either solve a problem or limit an impact or solve the problems or open alternative. And then I think there is another point that uh, I think we, where technology or, or let's say creativity can bring is that it can help us to develop new, new food forms. You know, um, I was in a panel the other day with the person who has uh, developed uh, uh, Impossible Burger, uh, Impossible Food, uh, that I'm sure you know is, is, a, is a fantastic entrepreneur. Uh, but I always have something in my mind that tells me that I don't know if it's fundamentally right to have a plant-based burger. Why call it burger? Why not inventing savory food that is not called burger? So that's innovation. That's what you need to invent, developing your startup. You need to invent new food forms. The, 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 the best invention of Danone is the fact that you had entrepreneur that invented a new category. They said, we, and, and I'm not sure they, are, they said it this way, but they invented the fact that you're creating yogurt in a fridge and that it's becoming a daily consumption. That's the invention. And uh, when I was myself launching products in a country like India, that is a dairy country because they, they drink lassi or dahi, as maybe some, I don't know if you have Indian friends with us, uh, today, but but um, uh, this is hello uh, hello Kumar. So uh, I really struggled because they were very uh, understanding what dairy category is, but they didn't know yogurt very much. Yogurt at the end of a meal, and this is super tough in food to create a new moment of consumption. But if you are able to create that, then you have invented something very strong. So this is also where, so technology can solve issues, can help to bring creativity, and I think will also help to bring new food forms. Then if you, so I think there is also another element that's even more upstream. Huh? I think technology can help very much into having precision agriculture, making sure that you use exactly what you need and where you need it. That's extremely important. So uh, just before our call, I was with a, a startup in France called Axioma, who is developing basically bio, uh, bio uh, fertilizer 
uh, that enhance the, the, fertility, the fertilizer capacity by tens or 15. That means that practically, when you use their product that is fully organic, you have to use 10 or 15 times less fertilizer. This is super interesting. This is another area that is very interesting. Precision and reduction and alternative of, 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 of reduction. So many, many areas of, of, of innovation when it comes to the upstream part. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Thank you, Karin. Aiden? Hi, thank you so much for joining us today, Eric. Um, I had a question based on what you were talking about with um, topsoil. I'm relatively new to learning about this area. And so I was curious if you could expand a little bit more on what you were saying about all of our future being dependent on like six inches of soil and the degradation that's already happened. Yes, so, I mean, you know that uh, not all soils are uh, able to grow, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, if you go to a desert, uh, there is no topsoil anymore, right? So, so the topsoil has, 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 uh, has disappeared. Uh, and it takes uh, hundreds of thousands of years to grow one inch of, of topsoil. It's very difficult, actually. So, um, so that's, that's basically our lifeline is based on basically this very thin layer on average on Earth, if you take the topsoil and you average it to uh, surface, uh, uh, surface land, uh, you have an average of six inches. So of course you have areas where you have meters. If you go, for instance, uh, in Indonesia, uh, where you had volcanoes and where you have inch, uh, meters of topsoils, and you have areas where you have nothing like deserts, okay? So uh, agriculture, the capacity to grow food, uh, as long as it's not vertical farming, right? Uh, is based on the capacity, of course, to have fertile soil, right? And to have fertile soil, you need this topsoil. The intensification of agriculture has created the system where Soil, in the soil, what is happening? You grow, for instance, grass, right? Uh, grass is, 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 uh, and, 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 uh, is, is made of, uh, of organic matter uh, and, and is growing, capturing CO2, okay? Photosynthesis and creating grass, right? So I'm oversimplifying, it's horrible what I'm saying, but I'm being very, very, very short, right? So, uh, our agriculture system in the Green Revolution that had some successes said, well, once you have done your harvest, you remove everything from the soil. That's called tillage, right? So you remove everything. So you have a bare land. And what's happening in a bare land when it's raining? Any idea? It's eroding. Erosion, right? So because progressively it's eroding and densifying, what do you do? You plow your soil, right? And what do you do? You re-inject nitrogen and phosphorus to the soil. That's called fertilizer. Then you plant your seeds, it grows, and the year after you remove everything through the ledge. And you do that 10 or 15 years and you have no topsoil anymore. Right? This is one, one big problem we're having in, in, since the green revolution. This is why regenerative agricultural practices will tell you first, you stop tillage or you till maximum three centimeters, right? Because you need to keep the roots because when the roots are, uh, are dying, they are deteriorating and the carbon matter they had becomes a fertilizer for the soil. And by the way, what does transform the roots into fertilizer? The worms. Very good technology, huh? worms. I can tell you. So super technology. Huh? It's like bees, huh? very good technology. Huh? So, <laughs> So, so you, you, have, you have worms and they're transforming that into fertilizer. And, and basically that maintains the fertility of the soil. 
So that's that's one area. Other other big big um, uh, reason for soil erosion, especially in developing countries and in uh, rice culture, for instance, is that uh, what's happening is that very often you, you you basically irrigate, 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 right? So you put a lot of water. There is sun. It's evaporating. The soil is drained, and and progressively you, you lose your soil. Okay. So that's that's how topsoil is disappearing and, and desertification and acidification of soil is happening, right? You have even civilization that died because of that. Uh, if you take, for instance, the Sumerian civilization, that was one of the most advanced uh, 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 civilization uh, before uh, before Christ. Uh, they, they, they basically disappeared because by over irrigating their soil, they became deserts. And by becoming deserts, basically they couldn't produce anymore. They went into war, and uh, and basically the civilization was uh, was wrecked. So I'm a bit uh, simplifying the process, but but that's that's a very big big uh, big reason why. So soil is super important because everything is is relying is relying from soil. And when I was making the change with the, the connect, sorry, with climate change, it's because when you don't till, or when you keep, you keep crop rotation with deep rooted, for instance, legume production, what do you do? Is you are capturing carbon from the air, storing it into the soil and transforming it in carbon matter. And this is why the IPCC model consider that about 28 to 30 percent of the journey towards the 1.5 degree scenario is also dependent on the capacity to restore soil health globally. There is a very good movie that expands that maybe that you can see on Netflix, that is made by Kiss the Ground, that maybe you have uh, you have seen and that I really encourage you to to watch. It's uh, one one hour and forty minutes, very well invested time, uh, and uh, you can check it on Netflix. It's called Kiss the Ground. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Pierre. Um, hi, thanks so much for being here with us. Um, really fascinating stuff. I had a question. Um, I really anchored on your trillion dollar figure. Um, on global agricultural subsidies. And I have two questions linked to that. One, how do you like, how do you think about responsibility for the public sector versus the private sector in getting us to 1.5? Like, is it all in the public sector or does the private sector also have some responsibility? And two, the public sector getting wrong. Like, as far as I'm concerned, I'm sure people of the European Commission that makes that make these decisions for CAP have the best intentions and are trying to fix this. So like, what are they getting wrong? What's the trade off? Um, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I always want to, I think in all these things, Pierre, uh, we have always to be very humble. So uh, I, 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 uh, these are very complex topics and I, I am no one to say uh, that someone is wrong or right. Huh? But I can, I can tell you my convictions, right? So um, first of all, um, The problem of transitioning a system is that you need to transition from point A to point B. And that between the transition of point A from point B, you have people that are not going to transition. So you need to address the question of what do you do with the people that do not transition? And this is a massive, complex political issue. I give you an example of a conversation I had in my career with, a, with a, an agriculture minister. He was telling me that each time agriculture in his country was making 5% productivity, that putting 30 million people out of job. 
And, and, and this man who was very smart, and I agree with you, they are very smart and they want to do good. He knew that he needed to make uh, productivity for his agriculture to be resilient and competitive. And by the way, for the farmers to live well from what they were doing. But he also knew that in his country, he cannot create 50 million jobs per year. So when you are a politician and you need to be reelected every four years, five years, six years, whatever your country is, then what decision do you take? This is why this is a complex topic. So, and, and super political. So, and this is why I'm very humble because I have to manage uh, what I have to manage in Danone and I don't have to manage hundreds hundred and millions of people. You know what I mean? So, so, so this is, so, uh, uh, but, but yeah, I think you're right. And on the other end, what is, uh, what is absolutely necessary is uh, to have a vision for the future. Um, and I think we are a bit lacking that right now. I think one of the things that we are lacking globally is what's the unviable future. Uh, I think my parents, your grandparents, I guess, had some ideology that were describing for good or bad, an unviable future. I think we lack an unviable, an, an unviable future. And I think that's a big mistake that uh, the ecologist movement is making by thinking that we can only drive the transformation by fear or by individual universalism. I think we need to be much more selfish in the way we manage the transition, making sure that this is speaking to the individual interest of people. This is why it's extremely important to internalize externalities in our economic model. And, that, uh, and this is a political decision. Uh, and I think there is financial resources to do that. So that's my conviction. So, but I am, I, I am not uh, president of anything. So, so but, but, but that's, that's, um, so, and, and I have also a very good friend who, who is um, very often, uh, he used to be a minister in one of the Latin American countries. So he was telling me one of the problem is that the agriculture minister um, actually, uh, uh, I mean, that there should not be any ministry of agriculture. There should be a ministry of alimentation or ministry of ecology. And, uh, and that's not, that's, I understand what, why he's saying that as well. So, so because when you are minister of, of agriculture today, you're minister of the status quo of an industry that you are uh, leading. But you're also responsible for millions of people and families. So, you see, so that's, that's, uh, that's the equilibrium. But where we need to be hopeful together is that, the, the, again, that's what I said, I really believe the room for maneuver are there. I mean, look at the scenario that we're living right now. I mean, one year ago, I was, I think, at the, the, the agriculture seminar of, of, uh, of Harvard and teaching on, on, on a case. And, um, At that time, I mean, who could have thought that all the governments would get rid of their problem of debts and just be, be basically opening the wallets to finance uh, billions and billions and billions of euros of economic support. Everybody was telling us, well, debt is very important and you know, and there's no money and you see. So the room for maneuver are there. It's just about uh, to have a, a social consensus of where the priorities are, and this is where citizens have a, have a very big role to play, according to me. So it was a long, long answer, Pierre. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just in that, where do you see the role of the private sector then? Because you've talked about why it's hard to be a politician, and what we as citizens can do, but what's the responsibility for a company like Danone? Yeah, I think the responsibility of a company for Danone is to, like Danone, is to have a vision 
and to uh, align its, its business model with its vision. Uh, um, our vision is to bring health through food to a maximum number of people and one planet, one health. That's our vision. So, so our responsibility is to ask ourselves is if is the is the world better or worse with with our with, with Danone? I think that's our responsibility. So companies have to align their business model with their vision. That's their responsibility. And 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 it's not easy. And we are not sustainable in Danone. And I know that, but we're working hard on it. We're not a sustainable company. But we're working hard on it, and we're making a lot of, we're putting a lot of money and efforts to make it happen. We make acquisitions of plant-based business. We uh, integrate that into our dairy business to create the right tension and friction inside our own business model to create offer and flexitarism. And 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 you know we're not avoiding. You know we put the, the fish on the table, right? That this is what I mean. And when you do that. Uh, as a company, and this is very often what I say to my team, you need always to synergize two movements. You say, one, you need to really know where you can have an impact because that's you. This is your business model. And basically, uh, uh, where, you can, uh, where you can have an impact and where you can, you can act. And the intersection of that can become a purpose. Because I cannot impact any type of supply chain because even if I'm a large company, there are areas in my supply chain where I'm so small that I have no impact, right? So our private sector can do is by making, being, being very self-aware of what's based, where, where you are relevant and where you can have an impact and the intersection of that can become a purpose. Right, because here you're creating synergies. And so, so that's that's basically why soil health is very important for us. This is why agriculture model is very important for us. This is why flexitarism is very important for us. But just imagine Pierre, the first time I came to the Danon board of directors telling them that we're gonna discuss soil health. So, but I was fully convinced that there was a connection, right? So you have to do you have to do to do this type of work, and 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 I think, and I think that's what is super interesting, because that that's creating. But not all companies. I think we have a tendency now, and I'm a bit surprised by that in the media that a CEO must be having an opinion on every topic on hers, right? You know, when I was studying like you at your, uh, uh, you know, when you had a CEO of a company, the journalists were asking him about uh, his new product, uh, his financial results, uh, you know, all these things. Nobody cares anymore. People ask you about what do you think about the Georgia election? What do you think about climate change? It's very tough to become a CEO, right? So, uh, I mean, so, but okay, I think it's very important to know who you are and what's your connection if you want to be relevant. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We are unfortunately nearly at time. I think we have time for one more question with a one to two minute answer. <laughs> very sorry. Yeah, my, my answer are too long, sorry. I <laughs> love it. Um, next and last question would be from Alessia. So, no, Alessia. Um, it, it, hi. Um, <laughs> so actually, like my question relates a lot to what you were just the point you were just getting to around kind of how you um, how you get to like where your maximum impact is going to be. And I was wondering, you know, the class of problems that you're dealing with on a day to day basis seems from what everything you've been saying to be very vast <laughs> and also very deep. So I was wondering, like, as a as a leader and as a strategist, like, how do you personally think about how you're going to prioritize amongst all of those problems that you could focus on? Um, like, what does that look like or feel like on a day to day basis or year to year basis? Uh, 
So my first, my, my, again, this intersection, where, where am I relevant? Where can I impact? So the materiality is very important for me. So, so that's, and materiality doesn't always mean big. It means impact, right? So you're asking the right question, Alicia. So to enter that, you really need to know your business very well. This is why, for instance, I like very much life carbon assessment journey. And I always say that to companies that consult me on how to deal with life carbon assessment. I said it's very good because that, that forces you to deep dive into the understanding of your value chain, right? So that's, that's, that's the good thing in it. Because, and by doing that, you, ad, you understand the materiality, where your impact is, positive or negative. So that's how you have to prioritize, okay? That's the first answer. Then the second answer, to be also very honest, you need to have fun. So you also need to know where your guts are telling you to go. And the more you grow, the more you get old, the more you understand business, the more maybe your guts have very good intuition. So edge is not always bad. It can also has help you to make mistake and to know basically how things are, are, are moving. So that's, 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 I think, very important to keep in mind. Uh, uh, trust yourself, but uh, trust your gut, but never also underestimate the importance of verticality and depth in knowledge. Uh, so, and, and depth in knowledge, it's like, the problematic of transitioning of agriculture model, it takes a bit of time as well. Uh, so so you, that's, a, that's, and that's, that's one of the issues we have is we are running a bit out of time. And unfortunately, we have only 10 years to change the economic model. So that's where I am uh, extremely positive. As you can see, I'm always very creative, but I'm also a bit worried because I know the time is very short. And so, we will have at some point to take our decision to take the best available science and to take bets. And that's, that's what we need to do. Thank you. That was a wonderful closing remark. I would like to thank you again on behalf of all of us. Um, and I would ask all the participants to stay for two more minutes. David has a few closing remarks, but Eric, if you need to leave, it's... Uh, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Stay in touch uh, uh, on LinkedIn or social media. Very happy. Enjoy your time at Stanford MBA. You're very lucky to be there. And uh, I look forward to you changing the business model. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.